Welcome again to the panel on storytelling, how to stand out in a crowded space. My name is Dan Lola Dufour and I am your moderator today. I'm gonna to do some quick introductions. We're waiting for a few more panelists, but we've got here two of them. We've got Fasaya Longe, who is the owner and creative director of Kai Collective. Hi, Fasaya. Hi. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Hi, Al Harry. Um, for everyone, Al Harry is an account strategist at Google. How are you, Al Harry? Hello, Jamalala. I'm doing very well, thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Fisaya and Papa. And yes, another panelist is Papa Motaya, founder of a white space creative agency. Hi, Papa. Hey, I'm good. How's everybody doing? We're good. We're good. Thank you to all the um, attendees joining. I see you all. So a few housekeeping rules. We're going to go through the panel session with me asking the panelists questions directly for about 15 minutes, and then I'll give the attendees some time to ask questions. So please keep your questions in mind. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. If you look below, um, it says Q&A, you can type your questions there. And you can also say who the questions are directed to um, if you have a specific question for any of the panelists today. Okay, so let's get started. So this is the question for everyone. Um, I love it if you could all um, help me to understand your perspectives on storytelling. What does storytelling mean to you in your field of work and why is it important? So let's start with Papa. Hey, um, yeah, I mean, what does storytelling mean to me? Um, I, I mean, I'm an architect in training, by training, um, but I only kind of understood architecture through film. So what I'm saying is that, so I was studying architecture for my first degree, didn't really understand it. And then I took a year out to study film. Uh, and then I kind of understood architecture through film. So for me, storytelling is about, really about understanding the importance of creating moments and creating myths. I think mythology is like probably the most powerful thing that, like cements the story in our sort of collective consciousness. So for me, like it's about how do you create these transcendent cinemata cinema cinematic moments? And I don't think that really matters whether you're doing architecture, or whether you're doing design, it's about finding that moment that connects people and so, sort of cements an audience. Like, in my, in my office, we always talk about this idea and it's like this famous quote by Donna Tart, which says that like you can look at a painting for a week and never think of it again, but you can also look at a picture for a second and think about it your whole life. And for me, it's about like, how do you create that connection with people that allows them to continually go back to that memory, to like go back to that story time and time and time again, to the point that it now becomes so part of how they see the world that they become like a really strong reference point. So for me, like storytelling is about creating myths that translate into reference points that define who you are, what you are, and, um, and, and what you think. Okay, awesome. Um, so Fisaya, for you as a creative director and a designer of a women's wear brand, what does storytelling mean for you? Um, so storytelling means for me just getting across, I think that with every like mode of art, there's, you know, the product or whatever it is, but then there's also like a message or a bigger purpose behind it. So for me with Kai, that is women and women's confidence and um, just a brand that makes women feel their most confident and realize that there's no limitations on them. And so for me, it's about communicating that through everything we do, through our socials, through our newsletters, with words, but mm -hmm. also through the clothing. And so when I created Kai, I set out to create clothes that would make women feel that way. Um, but use clothing to do that. And I don't know exactly how we've been able to achieve that, but whenever women wear clothes, it's always like, Kai, it's always like, oh my God, I felt so confident. I wore this and I just felt amazing. I've uh, just had a baby. I haven't liked my body. 
but I wore this and I felt great. So it's like with every piece of clothing, it tells a story and it has a purpose and it makes a woman feel a particular way. And we, 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 we communicate that in our messaging. It's always that type of messaging about confidence, about empowerment, but it, uh, it has also managed to come across in the clothes. And I can only guess that that's because of the intention when creating the clothes. So for me, that's what storytelling would be like, use words, but also in the clothes. So whether that's like a puff sleeve or see-through, you know, piece of clothing that everyone wears, no matter what size, whether you're extra small or whether you're 3XL. So it's everything from the imagery to the words. Yeah, that's what storytelling is for me. That's really great. And I'm definitely going to come back to you so we can talk a lot about, you know, Kai. And basically, this has been like your triumphant year so far. So we're definitely going to come back to that. Um, mm -hmm. Alheri, hi. So with your work with Google and obviously Google products, what does storytelling mean for you? Um, storytelling for me means, I think the word that comes to mind is identity. So stories are used either to create an identity or to... Um, prefer an identity so I can use a, a story if, if you think about like to think really really large scale with creation stories and so on it's always the story of people trying to figure out how they got here and then in those people then trying to find their identity and when they're telling that story they're trying to get you to understand how they've come about realizing who they are so I always think about it as this mirror defect with one hand trying to figure out what is my identity? How did I get here? What's the story of me or the story of us? And then telling you on the other hand, this is my story. Um, interestingly, we had Black History Month in October and Black History Month in the US, I believe is in February, but then in Europe, it's in October. So I'm based in Dublin and with the Google Dublin office, I had the comms for the Black Googlers Network and our theme was interestingly enough, the power of storytelling. And within Google, within Dublin specifically, our sub theme was your story is your power. And now thinking back to every single activity we had, every single um, event we had, all tying back to owning your story, owning your identity, owning your power. So um, storytelling is not just, you know, like saying this out loud now, I'm thinking it's also not just identity, but it's also about power. The people who are the most powerful are the ones who can form a narrative, you know, are the ones who can um, create a narrative and get everybody else to catch on or to latch onto that narrative. When you think about it, when politically, economically, the most powerful countries or the most powerful entities are the ones who tell you, this is who we are, and you sort of believe them that this is who they are. And then they exert that power on telling other parts of the world or other people, or other entities, this is who you are. And then unless you're powerful enough to challenge and be like, mm, that's not who I am, then unfortunately you have this label that's been slapped upon you because someone leveraged the power of storytelling, either negatively or positively. So I mean, kind of comes to my mind. Yeah. Really happy you brought up that idea of power. So first of all, welcome Daniel Abassi, mm -hmm. an art director. Hi, Daniel. Um, so I actually have a question for you off what I asked the other people, but it goes back to what our Harry said about power. So storytelling and branding has the power to change societal mindsets, especially when you are the person in power. You can make people start thinking, be more forward thinking, be more open. And Daniel, for, from what I've seen about your work, a lot of your work has included, you know, gender non-conforming expressions in an African context. Um, why is that important to you? And how have you seen your work change the perceptions of what it means to be um, African and to produce African art and African direction? Hi guys. <laughs> Hi, Papa. <laughs> Um, so I'm sorry I'm late, first Good. of all, I had issues, uh, no connecting. problem. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Uh, so storytelling, power, non-conforming, being African and why that's important. Uh, I think it just boils down to a lot of my personal experiences, you know, like growing up, there was always like this, there was always like this notion that a lot of young people uh, have that, you know, you had to kind of like fit into a certain like steroid box or stereotype. So it's like, you know, even when it comes to education, like, oh, when you're going to school, you have to study to become 
a doctor or whatever. And I remember I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life when I was like, when I left secondary school, I was about to get into uni. So I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. I don't think I want to be a doctor or whatever. And because there were no institutions available within the space that was catering to some of the things that I found interesting, and it just seemed like I had to settle for a certain kind of like education. So when I began to kind of like study myself and like study all the kind of things I was really, really interested in and the kind of challenges I was also facing, I think within that spectrum, I was kind of able to have out um, a sort of, I wouldn't say a niche, but just like a little part for myself um, to be able to say, okay, this is the kind of person I am, this is the kind of work I want to create. And I'm creating this work, not because I want to, you know, become like the next big thing or become wealthy out of it, but because it's something I want, I'm passionate about. So over time, that kind of like evolved into me meeting people who are similar people who are also like you know they want uh they want to find a space or they want to find like um a voice like a space where they belong which traditionally you wouldn't see um, within like the nigerian society you have people who are young and they want to do uh, work in fashion you have people who want to do a whole career around quirky film and even that, when you now start going to all of these industries, you now see that, oh my God, there's some certain sort of like segregation within those spaces. Like, okay, um, like in this space, it's only this type of people from this part of the society that can only um, work in it. Like if you're, there's a particular time where it was like, if you're, if you're in fashion, it means you're from a wealthy home. Or if you're in art, because they basically everyone believes that, oh, you can't make a career out of it. Like you have to like, you know, have someone who is sponsoring you or providing funding for you. So a lot of that kind of just awakened in me this need to be like, okay, how do I attack or how do I make this, you know, this talent that I have or this ideas that I have come to life in a way that you know, that don't, not only just benefits me, but also proves to people that, okay, look, no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, no matter what part of or what level of the society you're from or whatever, you can achieve pretty much anything. Right. And I think that comes to power. And why I say that is because I feel like power has a lot to do with what you believe in and how strong your conviction is. If you're convinced that, okay, your ideas are like. So that's. Um, Al Harry, I think you're on. Can you mute, please? <laughs> yeah. If you're Again. if you're convinced if you're convinced that what you believe in is right, one. If you're convinced that what you're doing is what you should be doing, because I've noticed that a lot of times when you're chasing the right dreams, every other thing just means seems meaningless. Okay. So, and for someone who struggled for a long time to find what I wanted to do, it just doesn't, I don't imagine myself doing anything else. And I've seen a lot of people identify with the work that I create. And that just seems to kind of like reinforce the fact that, you know, you're on the right path. So mm -hmm. there are people who in the, in our society, uh, who are minorities, who are oftentimes, you know, shrunk into the shadows and all of that and had to like you know quiet their voices because of you know several different challenges and being able to see a body of work that literally talks about you and kind of like describe your, your type of like your experiences in a beautiful way in a nigerian society for that matter is very uplifting and i think that for me is the most important way to use your power. You know, when you're able to use that to um, uplift people. And it's funny because a lot of it happened unconsciously. And I think that's like, you know, I was just doing things that I love and creating work that was stuck in my head. And now we're at this point where, oh my gosh, everyone wants to, everyone is happier. People are more experimental with like the work to create um, because of that. Thank you, Daniel. 
Okay, awesome. Um, so I want to ask this to Papa and Fisayo. Um, you've, well, Fisayo, you've mentioned how your clothes make women feel great, whether they just had a baby, the way the form, the fits and all of that. How does narrative play a role in the way you think about designs? Does the direction begin with the story? So when you're creating your clothes and also Papa in terms of creative direction, do you think of, okay, the narrative you're trying to pass along first? Um, and then the story and then the designs or in which way, what is your process when it comes to building brands and then storytelling? Uh, Fisayo, you can go first. Okay, um, so for me, my process is very different, different collections, different times. Sometimes it starts from the country I'm in at the moment. Sometimes it starts from a book I'm reading on a line I read, but I think there's just the overarching, there's the brand, is it called a theme? There's the brand identity which generally has what my narrative is. So everyone knows that Kai is very, very woman-centered, very much about feminism, very much about confidence, very much about no limitations. And so that is in every single thing that we do. So um, yeah, it's just like the overarching message. And then the actual creative process, a lot of the times is very, very different, but because we have that overarching message, that's not going to change. It might evolve to include more, more things, but it's always going to be there. Um, everything else flows out of that, really. Does that um, answer the question? Yes, Papa, before you answer, I actually want to ask Sai a, a second part of that question, because one thing that um, a lot of people have seen about your brand is that you, know, you focus obviously on the storytelling, but also the end product. So, um, you know, reducing waste, I don't know the terminology, but you try to reduce the waste in fabrics, cruelty free and vegan, vegan leather, all these things. How do they then play into what you've said about your brand? Is that part of the mindset that you keep in when you're producing? Yeah. Um, yes, it is. I don't actually call Kai, like sustainability is very big at the moment. I don't call Kai a sustainable brand because it's not hundred percent sustainable, but I'm always trying to be more sustainable because at the end of the day, the most sustainable thing is to be naked. Like fashion <laughs> is just not a sustainable industry or to wear clothes that already exist, you know, to creating more clothes is not very sustainable. So I don't really believe in like sustainable brand but I believe that each brand can take steps to be more sustainable. And so for me, I'm always learning and I'm always evolving in that. So for example, with Gaia, if we had every dress looking, they had the exact same print on every dress, a lot of fabric would have been wasted because we had to do the print on all, all of the fabric and we would have to use fabric placements to have it exactly the same. So I'm like, actually, no, it's fine. Some people are not happy that what they get isn't exactly what they saw on the website, but we make it very clear. And right. it's fine for things to look different. And for, I think it's quite exciting. So just things like that. And with like packaging, shifting from using plastic packaging to paper packaging or cardboard packaging. So I'm always like trying to be more sustainable. Um, okay. Yeah. So Papa, over to you. So how does narrative play a role in the way you think about designs and direction? Do you begin with the story? Um, what's your framework? <laughs> I mean, because we work in such a broad spectrum within yeah. the creative industry from like everything from like concept design to like a finished building. You know, we collaborate with amazing people like Daniel. Um, I think for us, it's always about like the place. So context is like really, really crucial. And then I think, you know, context, materiality is really, really important. You know, because I, I think those two things, when you situate like a thought to like, okay, who is this person? Where are they from? What is this product? Like, where, where does it exist? And I think that comes to this idea of voice, right? There's a tendency, and I think Daniel touched upon it, to sort of like generalize a voice, right? And how even when you do get like a community, again, within that community, there's even like, there are other communities, right? So there's never just one story, right? Um, and I think what's important is for everybody to understand in the same way that like, oh, when people talk about, oh, I'm a Nigerian designer or I'm an African designer, like, where are you from? Are you from Ebute Meta? Are you from Bagada? 
like where where is that context and how do you yeah. start from that position yes yes and then you move sort of like beyond that to like okay what is the materiality of this environment what is the sound of the street that i exist in and then you sort of like scale it up to like what is the conversation that has to be had and i think when you um, situate yourself in a place and you tie like that narrative to like an authentic location and you apply the authenticity of like materiality of the people within that immediate environment it, you can now go as big and as wide as possible right because you always have a really strong reference point. Right. so I, I think that's sort of where we like to think and and the most important thing i think is research i i think people underestimate how you need to really interrogate your work. You know, it's easy to say, oh, I want to talk about this thing today, but how well do you understand it? And how relatable is it to like your context, your environment and the things that you say that you're doing? I, I like what Visayo said about how she doesn't want to say that she's a sustainable brand because like it doesn't make it, it doesn't, doesn't speak the truth, right? It's an easy thing to tag on and to add on. But I think when you're, telling the strongest stories it's about how do you take something that is really really local and contextualized to you and and tell that and I think I mean I'm sure Daniel will speak to himself and I think that's what that's why he's been able to be so successful right in in the kind of stories that he's he, he tells right right um great so uh, Harry so you you help companies grow their customer base using Google products um, how do you determine which products best align with their target audience? Because that's a really important part. When you talk about storytelling, as Papa said, relatability, and obviously you have to understand the people um, and your customers. So how do you determine which products best align with the target audience? Oh, that's such a good question. And um, at the risk of, just stop me if I'm going into like Google speak or Google jargon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the risk of not doing that, pretty much, um, just a bit of context. So I work with the Sub-Saharan Africa market and most of my agencies who I service are based in South Africa. That's just because they have the most advanced internet economy, so to speak, of the Sub-Saharan African, of the subcontinent, right? So in working with these agencies, then somebody comes to me and I work with all agencies from retail, finance, um, auto, let me think about my book, um, and pharmaceutical health insurance and so on. When they come and most of the time, you always have to start with Google search, right? Because thinking about it now, search is intent-based. You go on Google when you're looking for something. So if you see an ad, it's not out of place because you're looking for something anyway. However, while Google search is always the, the doorway or the best place possible to start for any but small, big, medium, whatever the case is, you should have a very strong search presence. That's not always where um, clients should end. What makes a lot of money actually is YouTube. So think about when you're watching YouTube and you see all those ads. A fantastic ad on YouTube does so much for the client awareness, for the client's customer base, for consideration and all of that. So whenever we have a budget or, or I mean, Black Friday is right around, around the corner. So you can't imagine life, how many things have broken that we've had to fix, how many emails and meetings and policy and all the back and forth. But I always say to people to start with your end user in mind. I think the fundamentals of storytelling and the fundamentals of um, meeting a need stay the same, whether you work at Google or you're trying to work on digital agencies or you're a designer or you're, you're doing food, everything always stays the same. You start from the end and work backwards. So I always would advise them, um, who do you want to serve? Are they on YouTube? Are they looking for you on YouTube? And I mean, the numbers, like Google is a data-driven company. So the amount of numbers we look through are, it's insane, right? But fundamentally, it's always, who do you want to serve? So let me give you an example. I had a, I have a client who does, they do resale of um, Apple products. So in their country, they're the only licensed reseller of Apple products. So MacBooks, um, iPads, iPhones, and so on. And very often they'll bring their ads. And I'm just like, this is a bad advert. Like <laughs> nobody's going to watch your ad because you have to always think about, you're not selling the, 
you're you're not selling the the MacBook to someone who already owns the MacBook. You're selling to somebody who wants to purchase a MacBook. So there's no point going in depth into all of these other features. Just tell them one, two, three. Here's what you need to know. And if you go then a bit more technical into like Internet Speak, then the ads that work the Um, I think we're losing our oh, Harry, or is it just me? Can everyone hear me? Okay, I think we I think we lost her. So I'll just move. Okay, I'm yeah, here. you're back. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, okay. If you, yeah, yeah, I think maybe we need to turn off your video uh, for a little bit because it's sometimes that affects the quality. Oh no, you're okay now. Let's continue. So okay. You, so um, saying... I was just rounding up. I was just rounding up and I, and I was saying that always to avoid not going to technical, it's always um, in the first five seconds, we should see your call to action. You should tell us exactly what you want us to do with this ad and we should know exactly who you are. People do it differently. So if you think about Netflix, right, they've done it by ear. So there's an auditory, like there's the sound. I don't know if it's a pin drop or a water drop. There's something when you go on Netflix, there's that sound that comes up that you hear. Um, for other brands, for example, I'm trying to think of another one off the top of my head. For Google, you know the Google colors. Even if you might not be able to arrange them, you know there's blue somewhere there, there's yellow, there's red, there's green. We have our Google colors. For Facebook, there's the Facebook blue and white, right? So you have to figure out something that I see this in one second or I hear this, I know this is exactly the brand. This is exactly what um, I'm supposed to do with the advert, so to speak. So yeah, I hope that helps. No, it does. Thank you. So I want to direct this question to both Daniel and Papa. Um, so what I've noticed is that a lot of older, more established brands struggle to move with the times. You know, they are if they're predominantly offline and they're trying to come to, you know, online or Instagram or whatever or using Google products, um, we tend to struggle. They want to stay authentic to who they think they are, but also go with the times. And there's always a concern about following trends. Um, what advice would you give older, more established brands, Nigerian brands, specifically African brands, on balancing being themselves and taking on modern approaches to branding? So let's start with Daniel and then we go with Papa. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you give um, to older brands who are trying to yeah. connect with the modern. younger market? Yes. Um, while staying original yes. to the brand ethos? Well, it depends on what the brand ethos is. If the brand ethos does not involve evolution, then they will be stuck where they are. So I feel like a lot of brands have this um, idea. I, I always be like, okay, I, sometimes I, I like to ask designers, at what age did you start your brand? If you started your brand like at the age of like maybe 25, what was happening within the social circle around that time? What was the what, 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 what were the thing that you know made people come to get your clothes? Um, you if you look in, you actually realize it's still the same type of values and still the same type of like um, baselines. It's oh wow, I love the style. Oh, I love how it makes me feel. Oh, I love the message behind the clothes. Oh, okay, I can wear this to this place, I can wear this to that, I love the functionality of the clothes. So it hasn't really, really changed the baseline. All that has probably changed is the timeline and the type of people who are living in the timeline. So oftentimes some brands I've noticed, they kind of grow um, along with their market. So if you had like um, clients who were 25, within your age group, when you set your brand at 25, by the time you're 30, those people have also grown. So you begin to kind of like cater to them as they grow. And that's why it feels like, oh my gosh, you're now this old brand that doesn't cater to the younger generation. Um, what I would always advise people is leave room for, you know, for people to come in. So let young people into your brand I like that. from the design room. Yeah, let young people into your brand from the start. As as you evolve every um, maybe decade or this thing, make sure that the people on your team and be one or two people that are young. So not necessarily because they, they're gonna change your brand, whatever. It's just so you kind of get like a fresh take on, okay, what exactly are the young people doing out there in the street? 
in the present generation right now, a lot of young people love the idea of showing skin. They love the idea of when the clothes is body heated. They love the either that or they love the idea of when it is over exaggerated looks. Maybe the shirts or the tops are like all over the place. Um, why are they doing that? Why? What's making that the go-to thing? And okay, so how can I tweak that into my aesthetic? You know, so you can still maintain your relationship with your aging founding clients. It's aging, but plug, <laughs> <laughs> but kind of like find a way to plug in. Uh, I love the I love what Diola Sego and Clan do. They're they're such an iconic um, pair. Like I like to use them as a reference. Like. Clan is very experimental and Clan kind of like just like stays with the time, you know, like, you know, the, I, I've, I've seen the brand like, you know, grow from just being very young and chic and trendy to becoming chic for like this ideal women, like, you know, like women who are like um, are maybe in the corporate space or like get into their 30s. But then they still have things that, you know, will cater for an 18 year old or like a 19 year old. Uh, in some of the pieces so that's like a good mix and match so and i think that only happens when you have young people who work within your team and i think that's one advice i can give okay. <laughs> have young people who work with you at every point as you grow yeah and i think that probably cuts across other demographics you know gender yeah um, yeah and yeah and race and everything Papa, i mean also it's sorry it also comes through representation Yes. And, you know, we have this global conversation about representation. Representation doesn't just end at skin color or at um, where, what part of the world are you coming from. Yes. It also can apply to age, especially if you're a brand that's like, you know, wants to stay relevant in all times. And when it comes to like the brand message, make your brand ethos the time. I love the, I love Kai's brand message is confident. Um, women, woman who's confident and you know does it all so every woman wants to feel that way every girl wants to grow up to aspire to that do you get so when your brand message is like that it's very easy for you to like cut across all you know oh, all generation. thank yeah. you daniel papa do you have anything to add um, to the idea of how do you know yeah. all brands balance yes yeah, I think Daniel said it, which is, I, I think people need to understand what representation is. And I think when you start something, there's a sense of entitlement to a space. Like I created this space, but what you never, what you, we should always realize is that that space in that moment is the conversation that is happening now. And conversation changes as time moves along. Representation changes as time moves along, right? So you're always going to be at some stage like behind the times, right? Because you start, from, it's like right now, everything that we think the world is, right? Whether we're talking about what representation looks like right now in 15, 20 years time, it's gonna look totally different. Like how we think about like materiality, leather, cotton, all these things in 10, 15 years time, it's gonna look totally different. But in this moment, it feels like we're sort of transform transformative, like we're doing something really exciting. Like in my office, for instance, we have like a 10, we have a 10 year limit on the creative director, right? So I have like my tenure is gonna be up in about, I think like three, four years time, right? And the idea about that is that you embed evolution in, into, your, into your fabric, into your company ideology, into your, and that forces you to constantly realize that like, I'm having a conversation for now, but I need to hand over to that, like that yeah. baton to like a next generation of people who are gonna see the world totally different to me. And I think there's some brands out there that do it amazingly. Um, but I think Daniel has said most of the other things. Um, but my thing is like, you need to incorporate it into how you operate as a business fundamentally to ensure that you're able to, to, to evolve because that, evolution has to be intentional. I think most people think, oh, I'm just gonna like, I'll work it out somehow, but you need to kind of integrate it into the fabric of who you are as an organization. Okay, thank you. I really like that answer around evolution. I think there's something that a lot of people need to keep in mind as their brands get older and, and, and expand across you know, regions. Um, so I have a question for everyone and I'd like for Sayo and Alheri to go first and then the guys. What mistakes 
did you make earlier in your careers with regards to branding a product storytelling and what did you learn from it i hear you look very excited so <laughs> i'll let you go first <laughs> and then no i'm not i feel I, I i i feel triggered um because i feel like i made so many but i wanted to quickly touch on the last question you asked right yeah. and that's because i work with imagine like i'm a young Nigerian girl in my 20s and I'm black, I'm female, I'm young. And then I work into, and then I, I work at Google and I walk into boardrooms and I'm saying, listen, you need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on this particular campaign. And my demographic I'm dealing with is usually like old white men. And they're just like, we're not going to spend that. And then I have to be like, even if you don't spend that, listen, your competition is going to eat your market. I mean, in nicer words, but you just have to say it. And it's interesting that you're asking this question because even when I was interviewing for Google, that was one of my interview questions. Imagine you have a newspaper, they've always done print. Now you want to convert them to use um, online media. How do you do it? And I just had to like fumble my way around. Thankfully, I still got the job, but um, I think it's so crucial. It's so critical for people to, um, as Daniel and Papa said, like infuse in your brand, infuse in the decision makers, people across different demographics, age, race, gender, whatever it is, just having that voice, that additional voice makes such a difference, right? I've been on a call with somebody who, such a charming old gentleman who didn't know how to copy and paste. So we're trying to create an ad and he, like, where do you even start if somebody doesn't know how to copy and paste on their computer? And then he was selling, um, I won't go into the details, but he was selling like some product that was kind of, I was kind of blushing all through the call because it was a, it was like intimate products that he was selling. And I kept thinking about even this man was so eager to go online and so eager to sell across, to sell using the internet. Whereas the other people who are selling things and just refuse to innovate, right? I have one client I was working on. They started hundred years ago at the Spanish flu and they do funeral insurance. And imagine being able to serve and survive hundred years later. Now we had the coronavirus. And whereas in the past they would have brokers who would go house to house giving people like, oh, get your funeral insurance, get your health insurance with us. Now they couldn't have brokers anymore because we're all on lockdown. And I said to them, this is a fantastic moment for you to pivot your brand and tell your customers, I was there for you when we could meet in person. Let me be there for you now that we can only meet online. Oh, Thankfully, yeah. it was of you know the old white men but thankfully like they bought the message and they survived and they actually had a fantastic year 2020 that was bad for a lot of people right so it's just so key your, your your last question um to quickly answer this one and i'll be very quick i think one thing i didn't realize specifically on storytelling is that you the story you tell of yourself is not always going to be the story that people know about you so you have right. to be very conscious of um of the appearance or of the mark you leave in the world. That sounds so philosophical, but let me, for example, at work, right? At Google, they'll say to us, oh, like your work is flexible. You have your targets. However you go about hitting your targets makes a difference. That's cool. In theory, you can stroll into the office at 11 a.m. If you're an afternoon person and you schedule your meetings between 12 and four, you get your work done. That's, that's all fine and dandy. But then what I realized was my colleague who comes to work at 7 a.m looking sharp in his nicest shirt and with his hair combed with a fresh haircut people would just assume he was such a hard-working person and i'm like this guy is my friend we sit beside each other at the office he doesn't do five million things more than anybody else does but just because of that personal brand of showing up on time showing up looking clean and snappy and smart he was automatically as assumed to be the most hardworking, the most forthright right so Whereas you can sit in your house and give yourself all these adjectives and labels, if you don't find a way to marry that personal identity you have with what people see or with what people recognize, then there's a disconnect and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to figure out what do, like, how does a quote unquote hardworking person show up? Even if that's not really how you show up, you have to find a way to make sure that the story you're selling is being bought by your audience, so that's to speak. So. Yeah. And I think it still goes into like even listening and knowing what your audience is thinking of your brand. Like you have to pay so much mm -hmm. attention to that because for a lot of people, they're mm -hmm. so caught up in this is who I want my brand to be. This is what my story is. And they don't understand like what you said. This is how it's actually coming across. 
Um, so that's a really good example. Yep. So first of all, what are the mistakes you made earlier? Oh, even your- for yes, oh, Harry. No, no, I was going to say, or even for people who refuse to adapt culturally, right? Um, I was on a call the other day and I was speaking with older Nigerians who were like maybe 50s, 60s. This wasn't even for work, just um, some charity I'm involved in. And going into the meeting and I had to be like, oh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uncle. Good afternoon, auntie. And my friends were around me and they were like, wow, that's so, why do you adapt that way? And I just said to them, it's all about reading the room. Like I can't go in and be like, oh, I went to college in America. I'm going to talk to you the way we talk to people in America. No, because then I lose regard in their eyes. And no matter what I have to say, it's not going to be bought. So read the room, figure out where you are. And it's not being inauthentic. It's just being wise and adapting to whoever you're communicating with. That's that's my opinion. So that's something I didn't learn. Okay, Fisaya, what? What mistakes did you make earlier in your career with regards to branding and what did you learn from it? Um, I was thinking when you asked this question, I've made a lot of mistakes with things like manufacturing, but like I'm thinking with branding, what mistakes did I make? I think that things that, you know, might have been mistakes have led to where it, Kai is now. And so I think that what has been most important is like listening and like keeping your ears to, you know, the ground and what, you know, it, quite a few people have said, um, like Daniel Papa about having different people in the room. So because it was such a small business, everything kind of came from me, but mm-hmm. a lot changed when I started like asking my friends, just people around me and even the customer, the audience, lots of questions and asking them what they wanted. I was then e- able to evolve the marketing and evolve the branding. So for example, when we first started, so our hang tags have always had a message and that's something that has always been very important to me. I've always wanted like a really good thick hand hang tag that had a message. And so at first they said like, oh, Kai is for, you know, strong women and the women who raised them to inspire you to embrace your femininity in all its forms, something like that. But then after a while, I realized that I didn't really believe in that because it's not only for strong women and women don't have to be strong. And so much comes with the trope of like a strong woman. (laughs) Yeah. And so from doing that, you're shutting up other women that, you know, may not be there. And like, why do you have to be strong? No, you don't have to be. So just listening to things like that. And even like, you know, when I say like confidence, you don't have to be already confident, but it's just about the journey. And that is, you know, where we're trying to get to. So just evolving the message when I realized like not being too stuck in my original idea and um, evolving when I like when I had better information, really. Um, so, yeah, I would have spoken to more people earlier on and been more open to change and realizing that, you know, my ideas are not necessarily always correct or always the most evolved. I guess also because you're not the only one wearing your clothes, you know, you exactly. want more people. Yeah. So, Papa, uh, what life lessons did you learn earlier? Um, Like, I think the hardest lesson I learned is that you just need to, you need to demand, like, your space. Like, I I think, and I think there's a tendency to, you know, I I, I mean, I'll tell you a story. Like, Like, when I was studying architecture, there was this guy I really wanted to work for, and, like, and I finally got the job and I was like, oh, cool. He was like, I'm not going to pay you. I was like, don't worry. <laughs> and like for a year, I had to get like a weekend job. I was sleeping in the office the whole time. And at the end of my year, he took me. He was like, oh, where's, where's the restaurant you ever wanted to go? I told him. He took me there, the whole team. Everyone was telling me how amazing I was. I thought, man, I'm going to get this massive check at the end of it because he's seen my hard work, all of this thing. And... He gave me a book, like he literally gave me a book. And I asked him, I was like, look, sir, like, I mean, and he was like, I hope this is a lesson for you because you've been with me a year and you've never said what it is that you want. Like you never told me. And I think that was the moment that I realized that like, you have to create that space. You have to have your voice heard. It's so important. Like all this thing you can be thinking in your head, though, but speak it out. Like speak out who you are, demand what you want, 
And that is where powerful storytelling begins. That's really interesting, but that man was wicked. Like he couldn't have said, he couldn't have come to you and said, what, okay, you're young, what do you want? He has to wait a whole year. <laughs> But this thing is thing, like if we assume that because he's older than me, he should know better, he should guide me. I mean, why? Why do we think like that? Like that that was me. I removed the agency from myself, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I I created a space where I was like, oh, this guy is here, I'm here. Like there's no opportunity for me to talk. And I, I don't think he, I mean, obviously he's not the greatest human being ever, right? <laughs> but at the same time, he taught me the most important lesson ever, which is like, look, you want something to happen, you need to open your mouth so and, and okay. speak it. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Um, Daniel, uh, what, le what lessons have you learned what, from your mistakes earlier on in terms of branding and storytelling? I mean, on a, I'm usually like an overthinker, like when it comes to everything, <laughs> myself, work, and how I perceive myself. And I'm very, it's funny because I'm more, I'm more very introverted. So I've not, I've never really done uh, a sort of like intentional branding. So, <laughs> so in the sense of you decide, okay, this is how I want to be perceived, this is how I want um, to look like. It just seems like everything has kind of like, formed this whole image and there's like several misconceptions people have about me that oftentimes when I hear it I'm like wait what <laughs> I don't I'm not sure like I was like, I was like oh we've, we've heard you this is the kind of person you are and I'm like um, I have no idea so but like what Papa said kind of like brought that back because like if you don't have a way of defining visibly who the, who you are people have this interesting way of just creating it for you so especially as artists like it's and it's also very difficult for people to separate the artist from the work that you're creating so the conception people have about you the work that you've created everyone just mixes that together and believes that oh yeah okay that's the kind of person he is so i've kind of like made the mistake of never of just letting people decide what they want to decide about me. And I'm kind of realizing gradually how it can be both a good thing and can also be like also a bad thing. So, and I'm trying to work on myself to, you know, be more definite with explaining to people the kind of artist I am. And also, cause I noticed that I wear a lot of hats. I wear, uh, I work in styling, I work in photography, I also work in film. So. All of that kind of like this creates this whole huge, um, I don't know what's the word, like this whole huge combustion unit that could go up at any time. So I'm learning how to work with more people and learning how to appreciate collaborations more. And I think I was scarred a lot of times um, with collaboration in the past. So I think I'm just like getting myself about that. So I think that's pretty much. I'm actually happy you brought up collaboration. Great, I'm happy you brought up collaboration. So we have about 12 more minutes and we're going to take two more questions and I'll direct them at um, individual panelists. Um, but for collaboration, I'd like um, Daniel and um, probably Fasayo to answer this one. Um, how do you distinguish between something that feels authentic and something that, is, that just feels like a mindless collaboration? What's your approach to collabing and not losing your initial storytelling idea, your initial brand? Um, Daniel, and Daniel, can you go first and then we'll take Fasaya's answer. Um, when it comes to collaboration, uh, there, for me, there are two things I usually check. I check, I check the, I check the mark. I check who is, who is the target? Like, what are we, what are, what are we aiming at? And then why do you want to collaborate with me? You know, those are two questions I usually like to ask people. And if it's a very loose question, so like if the feedback I get back, it's like, oh, I'm collaborating with you because I've seen your work there, I've seen your work here, it's a no. So if the feedback I'm getting is because I feel like, okay, there's, so like if the feedback is more depth or more straightforward and oh, because I feel like we can achieve X, Y, Z together and you give me some facts, and I check uh, my business plan, if I have, if you have one, check my business plan, 
and check myself and feel like, okay, this work is actually going to benefit me. I feel like with collaborations, you kind of, as especially if a collaboration is being brought to you, you kind of have to be a bit selfish in the sense that whatever is being brought to your table has to really, really benefit you. Uh, either financially, either, um, I don't know, either mentally, either like economically, even just like relationship wise, it has to kind of like add a level of value to your work. A lot of collaborations are one-sided. So people come to you with all of these great ideas like, oh yeah, if we collaborate, we're gonna do this YZ, XYZ. And then when it happens, it just seems like, oh, we're working for someone as opposed to collaborating with someone. So that's something you need to be careful about with collaboration. Right. And I always tell people to have a contract for collaboration. I like the idea of a contract. Fisayo, um, on collaboration, what are your thoughts? So similarly to what Daniel said, two things are really important to me. Values, the, the values of the person, of the brand, and purpose. Um, I feel like this is actually an area where I made mistakes or almost made mistakes in the past. So for example, and it's always kind of out of desperation and you know needing money. So for me, it's very important now, like no matter what the check is to make sure that values and purpose align. So for example, when I first started my brand and I just really, really wanted to get it out there, you know, celebrities would message me or someone who has 5 million followers would message me and um, I would send them the clothes just because I was so desperate to get sales because the brand had nothing. Whereas like as the brand has grown and now, I am a lot more likely to collaborate with someone who has 1,000 followers and actually I like their style. I like the images that they take. Their values align with um, Kai's values rather than a celebrity that everyone knew who had 10 million followers. It doesn't really matter how much money it's going to bring if it's going to jeopardize my brand's value and my brand's purpose um, because that out, that's going to outlive the... 2,000, 10,000, 100,000 pounds I yeah. get from that opportunity. And just in the same way, like last year, Kai almost ended up on like one of the biggest e-commerce platforms and it fell through, but I was going to do it out of desperation again, just because the brand really, really needed that money. But then ever since that falling through, it's just been able to put a lot into perspective for me. And so, yeah, just those two things, value, purpose, for a moment, take away like the financial aspect finances are important but it's just not number one when it comes to collaboration values and purpose must align absolutely thank you so we're going to take one more question and then i'll go into we have about two questions from attendees um i'll hear you i love if you could answer this one so one thing we know about you know we're talking about how to stand out in a crowded space there are loads of people online there's a lot of competition and what i find is that a lot of brands are focused on follower growth or views only as a metric of success rather than brand love, product love, engagement, consistency. Um, what advice could you give people in terms of what to focus on digitally in terms of building the brand and storytelling? Um, the first word that comes to my mind is such a cliche, but I think authenticity. And it's interesting, I was listening to Fisayo speak and I have been following Fisayo since I was in um, A-levels in South Africa which would be my goodness, such a long time ago. And I remember, I'm not trying to fangirl, but there's nothing wrong with that. I remember when I remember when Fisaya turned 22 and she did a birthday shoot and I can never forget, there were two black balloons with the number two on them. And I thought that was so cool. I don't know if I had never seen black balloons or I don't know what it was, but I just thought, oh wow, this is so cool. And watching how she has evolved her brand now all the way to Kai and as someone who has been following over the years, I'm not shocked because it's always been there and her aesthetic has always been hers. Um, now think about if I were, let's say in a board meeting, now I'm trying to advise a brand that wants to break forth digitally. It would always go back to being what is your own value proposition or who are you as a brand and what are you selling, right? I had, especially when you're dealing in a very homogenous market, being a creative is a little bit easier for you to define yourself because this is Sky, this is this other brand, right? And we know who we are, we know what we stand for. But then imagine then last year, I had a lot of banks in my, in my book of business and 
every other bank is like every other bank. They give you the exact same thing. They might call it a different name or give you five. 2.5% more in interest or whatever, but they have the same proposition. Then it's now going back to saying, what is your story as a bank? It's homogenous, it's finance. We all sell the same thing, but what exactly um, are you giving? And then let's now begin to kind of explore that, right? It, it takes me back to even what, what I said earlier about Netflix. There's so many... Um, online video on demand platforms but thinking about netflix thinking about that n and the noise and the sound it's always going to be there on your mind right thinking about google and thinking about um the colors and the google font and the brand it's always going to be there on your mind right so it, i think it goes back to being authentic and it's it's the simplest thing like many times people try to crowd a lot of things on top of it but it's the simplest thing about who you are and staying true all the way you know to wherever your brand go grows to so i hope that answers the question yes yeah. Does. Thank you. So we've got a few more minutes and I, I have two questions from attendees. Um, the first one actually is directed at you, Ahiri. It says, hi to Ahiri's recent point. How do you market the importance of engaging the African continent to those rooms of old white men? Many still don't understand the market, its potential and the importance of including them in the marketing campaign. Oh my gosh. Tell them that <laughs> Oyo is their case. Like they're carrying last, you know. I know this is professional, but in like in all my meetings, I do try to pass that point across. A few years ago, 2020 has been 2020. So I don't remember if this was last year or the year before, but um, Sundar, the CEO of Google, came to Lagos and there was a whole visit because Google is doing something called NBU, next billion users. So India, Brazil, Nigeria, South Africa, I think a few different countries where the growth of the world really will be. And he had a fantastic time in Lagos and went back to the US. And on Fridays, we have TGIF. So ask any question you want to ask to the leadership. And someone asked him what was the best part of being in Lagos. And without skipping a bit, Sundar said, Lagos was the first place where he came and it was a business conference, like super business, super numbers. And once they were like, thank you for attending, music came on and it was, a party as hard as it was a business conference. I think that was when um, the song was popular. Small Doctor. I don't remember the name of the song, but if you know Get Money, Hide Your Face. Yeah. <laughs> and best believe they taught this man the whole dance and the whole everything. So in I'm, I'm using that example to say that the world is, I think we've said this so many times, like the world is paying attention. The world is taking notice. And for everybody who refuses to engage, it's just unfortunate that the band may leave them behind, you know. Even when I speak with um, a lot of these clients who are like, oh, we don't want to um, break into this particular demographic because they're not high income earners, they don't buy into our brand. People use all these politically correct terms when what they really just want to say is, oh, we still see Africa as a poor continent, right? Or, you know, we don't really think they have the buying power for our goods. And I'm Sometimes I'm just like, cool, like, don't do it. I have 10 other clients who will buy into it. But if you don't, I can guarantee you that in the next five years, your market is saturated and you will have nowhere else to grow into, right? So I, I try to combat that by telling them stories, giving them examples. The world's leading tech companies are, take, are paying attention. If you don't, we're at a critical point where it's just, I'm sorry, but... You're going to lose out. That's your problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this yeah. question, um, I think Papa and Daniel can take this. Um, so Rosemary said, I especially enjoy the discussion about older people and companies pairing with younger people. This could result as an amazing liaison and successful company. For example, I'm 60 and I paired with my daughter who's 27 and we produced the podcast. Wow. Um, how do you think this type of liaison can be encouraged and have you participated in something like this before? Papa, can you go first? Because you talked a lot about evolution and then we'll take... Daniel's thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important. Um, I think my only way is when I moved to Nigeria and I started work, um, there was uh, somebody that I was a lot older than me that was, um, that I, I really looked up to creatively. 
And for me, it made sense for me to, and it just kind of naturally happened. And one day we were just like, it makes sense for us to come together and work together. So like, again, like I'm saying within my organization, there's like, there's a structure that in, ensures that there's a generational connection uh, where you have people uh, or somebody that has a lot of experience and has a perspective that you may not have because you were only born on such and such a date and you kind of have a perspective of now. And, and I think it's really important that we don't segmentate, you know, we don't discriminate where we're now like, oh, everything cool that happens only happens because of youth, right? That's, that's a lie. Like, I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> it's the same idea. It's like saying that, like, yeah, old, old white men know everything or, you know, there is no one person that knows everything. There is no one segment of people that know everything. The most important thing is to share knowledge. And, and because, you know, I, I think like when we forget about where we are culturally and how the idea of storytelling for us is very, like it's an oral tradition, right? It's only of late that we're starting to use Western ideas of archiving through like books and written literature. And that, that, that sense of like a generation passing on traditions, orally rituals to the next generation. I think it's something that we should hold on to because I think it speaks to who we are as Nigerians, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Efik, whatever the specificity of our uh, tribal context are. So I think the old and young coming together is really, really, really important. And right. I, I think we should encourage it as we try and tell more diverse stories. Okay, Daniel, so how do you think this type of liaison can be encouraged and have you participated in something like this? I think in a way, yes. I think Papa and I have worked on a project before. Well, I think the stuff we did for Velisco, we tried to make a, um, an interesting brand that's been here forever. Cool. <laughs> when we did that, uh, it was a short film project. I think we worked on to uh -huh. yeah, an alien in town. So, and I remember this particular thing was such a challenge about how do you connect the older generation to the younger brand. And, I, and there was a lot to learn in that process because like heritage is so beautiful, like culture. Culture is the oldest of everything, you know? So you're born into certain cultures, you know, you have to learn all about it and then find a way to connect that to what's happening in your timeline. So, and I think it makes for the most beautiful visuals, it makes for the most beautiful ideas when you're able to um, fuse your culture that's old as whatever with your new ideas. So if, for example, I was to imagine um, what the a futuristic Owambe party would look like, you know, I would still imagine the, the silhouette of the, what's it called? the traditional Dili and all that silhouette, but I would imagine it done in such a, an interesting and kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like a very avant-garde, kind of like an avant-garde kind of like futuristic space. Case in point, Dela Sego's collection that she released um, about what, what was in the collection? It's a very galactic collection. Galactic, and yeah. I, yeah, and I remember saying to, uh, I think I was like, oh my gosh, to be honest, if we were in, Swing to, in, in the year 3000 and people wanted to do O on there or whatever, I would imagine him wearing something like this. And so that for me is an example of a brand that um, is very much influenced by very young people, but still keeps like the very traditional, um, still retains all the traditional elements. So it's not really that hard. It's just like, okay, let's all evolve together. Let's, yes, the, you know what? Uh, this is still our culture. Let's keep it intact while we can all evolve together. So, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your great insights, your thoughts, your comments, and for being so honest. Thank you for Sayo, Harry, Papa, and Daniel. Thank you to LLF Digital for organizing this and to all our attendees. It's been great. My name is Damio Dufo, and I've been your moderator today. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank Bye, you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Yeah.